Okay, <clears throat> this morning we have what could be called a sensitive subject. <laughs> uh, the reason I'm doing this sermon, normally I wouldn't even bother, um, but the reason I'm doing this is because there was some uh, sodomite at a university here a month or a couple months ago, and he <clears throat> did this big speech about how the Bible is BS, and he didn't say BS, he used the full words, and one of the reasons is because it teaches slavery. And a whole bunch of Christians are, you know, oh no, is that actually true? Does the Bible teach slavery? Well, we're going to look at that today. Okay? And this was a sermon request I had numerous people ask, what does the Bible say on slavery, the issue of slavery? <clears throat> so that's <clears throat> why we're going to be doing this this morning. Okay, now does the word slavery appear in your King James Bible? How many people think it does? No. The word slavery is not a King James Bible word. What about the word slave? Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 14 says, Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? That is the only reference to slave in your entire Bible if you have a King James Bible. Now if you have a new version like the NIV, they'll replace the word servant for slave. Okay, Which is kind of funny because the NIV is supposed to be more politically correct. You know, they, they change man to person or he to he and she you know they're they're supposed to be politically correct and yet they'll change servant which is not really offensive to a more offensive word like slave i find that kind of interesting and they've been doing that since the very beginning too by the way and many other new versions use the word slave okay but the bible term <clears throat> you can see there that slave yes in jeremiah 2 14 slave is the same as servant but the Bible uses the term bond servant. And we're going to look at that today. Now, <clears throat> who is the most famous bond servant in the Bible? Does anybody know? Anybody have a guess? Daniel. Daniel is actually a whole book written by a bond servant. Kind of interesting. So turn in your Bible to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 1. <clears throat> and people say, wait a second, Daniel was a was a bond servant? And that's a term I'm going to use, by the way. I'm not going to say slave because <clears throat> that's not really the, the proper term according to your King James Bible. But Daniel was a bond servant. Now, there are two ways to become a bond servant. We're going to look at that today. There's one being in captivity, and there's another being bought, being sold. Okay, and usually they're they're bought and sold after they went into captivity. And we'll look at all that. Daniel chapter 1 verse 1 says here, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim king of Judah came Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Okay, now what is that? He did not say, ask them if they want to come, and if they'd like to, maybe they could be part of the king's house. No, King Nebuchadnezzar said, children of the captivity there, the ones we just captured in Israel, you bring them to me. Did they have any choice? Did they have any say in the matter? No. Well, were they? They were bond servants. And they were Jewish bond servants. Okay? Very interesting. Uh, turn to... Second Kings, we're going to read a little bit more detail on this. Turn back towards the front of your Bible to the book of Second Kings. Comes right in between uh, First Kings and First Chronicles. Second Kings, we're going to go to um, chapter 24. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter... 24, we're going to read one verses 1 through 6. 
Okay, and we read here, In his days Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him, and the Lord sent him, or sent against him bands of the Chaldees, and bands of the Syrians, and bands of the Moabites, and bands of the children of Ammon, and sent them against Judah to destroy it. According to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants, the prophets, surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did, and also for the innocent blood that he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. You better think about that, by the way, if you're for abortion. There is no more innocent blood than that of babies that haven't even made it out of the womb yet. Okay? They didn't even reach the full term of pregnancy. And they're being slaughtered in this land by the millions every year. Better think about that. God will not pardon the shedding of innocent blood. Uh, verse 5. And by the way, let me just say this too before I continue. Just another little thought here. If you reject the, the shedding of innocent blood, Jesus Christ was innocent. And if you reject that, God won't pardon you. You'll go to hell and you'll burn forever and there will be no pardon. But anyhow, verse 5. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? So Jehoiakim slept with his fathers and Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his stead. Okay, so his son takes over there. Now, jump down to verse 10. And we're going to see here again this thing of being a bondservant according to captivity. Verse 10. At that time the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers. And the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. And he carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes and all the mighty men of valor, even ten thousand captives. Look at that. And all the craftsmen and smiths, none remained, save the poorest sort of the people of the land. King Nebuchadnezzar came in there and he took all the best people and the older people and the people that were sick. He left them there to die. So what a terrible thing. Yeah, war is a terrible thing, isn't it? Verse 15, And he carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon and the king's mother and the king's wives and his officers and the mighty of the land. Those carried he into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And all the men of might, even seven thousand, and craftsmen and smiths a thousand, all that were strong and apt for war, even them the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. So you see there the one of the well not one of the you see the leading cause of becoming a bond servant in your Bible. When that what happens is when when there's a war and that invading army comes in and they take over the city you got 10,000 people there, able-bodied men, you know, basically. And what's the king supposed to do? Nebuchadnezzar, he comes in and they say, we took the, we sacked the city and we came in and we got all these people here. Now, Nebuchadnezzar has one of two choices. Either he can just say, kill them all. And then you got a big mess there because you got 10,000 dead bodies. Or he can say, take them captive. Now, what would be more merciful for him to do? Take them captive. And if you had a choice, you're there, you know, I mean, let's just say America gets taken. China or Russia or somebody invades America, which is a possibility. And we're taken. We're, we're overrun. And they come in and they point guns at you and they say, okay, you can either become a bond servant to Russia or we can kill you. What are you going to pick? I think most people are going to pick to be a bond servant. <laughs> Say, you know, whoever I have to serve, whatever house I have to serve in or, you know, be a, a servant in, it's going to be a little bit better than, than getting a bullet, you know. <laughs> and that's what went on back then. So slavery was not so much like, a, you know, you're to go out and, and make slaves of all men or something like that. That wasn't the main thing of the Bible. It, it's a historic reality. 
Okay, it's a reality of war. All right, that's what happens. Now, were the Jews ever bond servants to a foreign power before the Babylonian captivity? And by the way, the Babylonian captivity, the reason that Jerusalem fell, is because they went after other gods. Hmm. Seems to me that there used to be a nation called America that used to acknowledge God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, and had veneration and respect for the King James Bible. Hmm. Actually, there were two great nations. You say, what's that? Great Britain and America. Both of them are going after other gods. Guess what's, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> this country is going to be taken. And we're going to become bond servants to another country, to a foreign power. But uh, anyhow, was there a time when the Jews were in captivity before this? Anybody think of a time? Egypt. Egypt. Okay. Turn in your Bible to Exodus. The book of Exodus. Back towards the front of your Bible. Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Okay, Exodus chapter 1, verse 13 says, And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Kind of interesting there, it says that they made them serve with mortar and in brick. Now, if you go to Egypt and you see a thing that's built with mortar and brick, you know, can anybody think of a, a big structure that's built that way? The pyramids, the Sphinx, and all these other big things. Isn't that interesting? Wouldn't that be something if some of those buildings were actually built by the Jews, the children of Israel? Very possible. You know, they're slave labor. So, Yes, the Jews were in bondage before the Babylonian captivity. And, of course, you can read the book of Exodus to how the Lord brings them out of bondage. Now, what about the Jews? Did the Jews ever have bond servants? We see that they had to serve as being bond servants, but did they ever have bond servants on their own? Turn back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verse 14. Now we're here we're going to read about Abram. And uh, if you read through the book of Genesis, you'll see that Abraham, you know, first he was called Abram. He was often afraid of the rulers and people of the area, and so he would tell his wife, you know, just act like you're my sister. And that's what's going on here. Genesis chapter 12, verse 14. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commanded her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Now look at what he gives Abram here. And he entreated Abram well for her sake, and he uh, and he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. So, it's just like right in with livestock. Here he's got these, you know, asses and camels and and you know, and whatever else. To, yeah, camels are mentioned. Sheep, oxen, and men servants and maid servants. You know. And there you go. Did Abram say, no, thank you, I don't believe in slavery? No. He took them. Okay? Genesis chapter 15. Turn over there. Genesis chapter 15, verse 12. This is interesting here because you actually see the prophecy of what happens in the book of Exodus. Genesis chapter 15, verse 12. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. 
Did it happen? Yeah, it did. It's what the book of Exodus is all about. But can you imagine that? Being slaves, bond servants, excuse me, bond servants for 400 years? Very interesting. There were actually Jewish people that lived and died as bond servants. They never knew freedom. <clears throat> Very interesting there. Now look at uh, chapter 17, verse 12. <clears throat> and here God is, is telling Abram that, that they're supposed to circumcise their, their uh, people. But look at what it says here. Genesis chapter 17, verse 12. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So yeah, they did own slaves. Now, you know, you're just going to have to deal with that if you're a Christian. Exodus chapter 20. And you know, there's a lot of negative things said about the practice of slavery. But the fact is, there was, you know, we're going to see later as this thing goes on that there are rules for uh, somebody who has bond servants. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. And we're going to see some of the Old Testament rules right now. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's commandment number 4. Six days shalt thou labor and do thy, all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and in it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Okay? Now, we'll just stop there. Does it say that your manservant, your maidservant, you know, your bond servants there, that they they're not, you know, they, they don't have the same rights and privileges, they're just supposed to work? No. They get the day off too. They get the Sabbath day off. You know? It wasn't some kind of a horrible, terrible thing. God said, you know, you treat them well. You treat them with, you know, the same the same rules apply to them as they do it to you, as far as the Sabbath day. Jump down to verse 17. It says here, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is uh, thy neighbor's. Okay? So again, you see there that they were perfectly fine having manservants and maidservants. Now, what about God's rules for bondservants? Exodus chapter 21, look over there, we're going to start at verse 1. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. Hmm. So if you buy another Jew. Now typically when you think of a bond servant, most people think of somebody from Africa. You know, a descendant of Ham according to what the Bible teaches. But they were actually buying Jews as bond servants. So your Bible doesn't single out a single group of people with a certain racial distinction there as bond servants. Anybody could be a bond servant. Okay? But you see there the thing about a Hebrew. Uh, verse 3, If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go, go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will no, not go out free, uh, then his master shall bring him unto the judges, he shall also bring him to the door, or unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever." That sounds like it wasn't really all that bad. You know, a bond servant actually saying, I don't want to go away. I don't want to leave my master. I mean, think about something for a minute. Think about, go back even to our own history of slavery in America. You got some guy coming from Africa, and yeah, he's bought, you know, he's taken from his tribe and whatever over there. 
You know why? Because a stronger tribe came in and took over. <laughs> and they take him and they put him on the slave ship and all this stuff and all these horrible things. And he comes here to America and he's bought by a rich plantation owner, we'll say. And a lot of times these slaves were given their own house. They were given plenty of food. They were given clothing. They were given a very nice place to live and work. Oh, what a terrible thing. Not necessarily. And there have I read I heard a whole sermon one time by a, a brother and, and he was reading testimonies of former slaves back during the Great Depression and they were like, Boy, I sure miss you know the slave days back before the Civil War. Boy, we sure had it good back then. It wasn't all terrible and horrible and evil. Okay, so this this whole modern system of political correctness that's you know trying to attack the Bible, they make slavery seem like it was this terrible thing. It wasn't. Now I'll grant you there were times probably that it was. I'll grant you that there were people probably that were that were cruel to their slaves and, and things and, and whipped them and beat them and whatever else. But a lot of times it wasn't that bad. And you see that right there. A bond servant actually saying, I don't want to leave my master. And the Lord puts a provision there that he can keep that bond servant forever. Let's continue. Verse 7. And if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, she shall not go out as the men's servants do. If she please not her master, who hath betrothed her to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed to sell her unto a strange nation. He shall have no power, seeing he hath dealt deceitfully with her. And if he have betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. If he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage, shall he not diminish and if he do not these things or these three unto her then shall she go out free without money okay so you see the thing there even a, a female servant bond servant a man could actually marry his female bond servant now jump down to verse 20 there and it says here and if a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod and he die under his hand he shall be surely punished Notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his money. Did you know a bond servant it was a was basically a possession? According to scripture? Yeah, they had certain rights and privileges, but the fact is, right there it says he is his money. Not very politically correct, I guess, but that's what the Bible teaches. Turn to Numbers, the book of Numbers. And I want to show you something here, and, and this is the kind of stuff that a lot of people are just not going to preach. A lot of preachers won't preach this type of stuff. But uh, we are Bible believers here, and so we believe what's in the Bible. Kind of basic there, you know, you can figure that one out. And so if the Bible says it, we believe it and accept it. And we don't care what the culture has to say about it. Numbers chapter 31, we're going to look at verse 1 through 12. And we're going to see here again, bond servants being made as the result of war. Numbers chapter 31, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites, afterward shalt thou be gathered unto thy people. And Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves unto the war, and let them go against the Midianites, and avenge the Lord of Midian. Of every tribe a thousand, throughout all the tribes of Israel, shall ye send to the war. So there were delivered uh, out, of the tribe, or out of the thousands of Israel a thousand of every tribe, twelve thousand armed for war. And Moses sent them to the war a thousand of every tribe, them and Phinehas the son of Eliezer the priest to the war with the holy instruments and the, tr the trumpets to blow in his hand. And they warred against the Midianites as the Lord commanded Moses and they slew all the males. And they slew the kings of Midian beside the rest of them that were, with, that were slain, namely Evi and Recham and Zer and Hur and Reba, five kings of Midian. Balaam also the son of Be Beor they slew with the sword. That's an interesting story there. He, you know, God told him what to do. And he said, don't listen to anybody but me. And he went and listened to somebody else. So the Lord just said, oh, you know, he's with the, the pagan people now. Go and kill him. Verse 9. 
And the children of Israel took all the women of Midian captives and their little ones and took the spoil of all their cattle and all their flocks and all their goods. And they burnt all their cities wherein they dwelt and all their goodly castles with fire. And they took all the spoil and all the prey, both of men and of beasts. So you, oh no, I'm sorry, i got to read verse 12 yet. And they brought the captives and the prey and the spoil unto Moses and Eliezer the priest and unto the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the camp at the plains of Moab, which are by Jordan near Jericho. So you see there a war, and all the men are slain, and they bring the women and the children. Now what are they going to do with them? Oh, just kill them all. Well, wouldn't it be more, more merciful to have them as bond servants? Yeah. Okay? And, you know... There were times when they were told to kill all the people because they were messing around with going after strange flesh and the, and the genes were corrupted, basically. But the whole thing there is, again, you see your two choices in war, either death by sword or become a bondservant. And you say, well, what a terrible thing. That's history. Okay, and, and to, to come down on the Bible because the Bible teaches a historical fact really is not very smart. Okay, You're not going to come down on a history book that teaches slavery. Why would you come down on the Word of God? But see, the, the lost world, they look for anything that they can get on the Bible. And a lot of Christians have been brainwashed into thinking that slavery was just this horrible evil and just you have to deny anything that's connected to slavery. No, the Bible is reporting on slavery as a historical fact. All right? Um... Now, what about other Jewish bond servants? Turn to Leviticus, which is the book that comes right before the book of Numbers. Leviticus chapter 25. This is also an interesting thing here. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 39. You're going to see another reason here why some of the, the Jews actually sold themselves into slavery. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 39. says here, And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant, but as an hired servant and as a sojourner he shall be with thee and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. Which we read about earlier there, the sixth he serves it for six years, and then the seventh year he goes free. Verse 41, And then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family, and unto the possession of his fathers shall he return. For they are my servants, which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but shalt fear thy God. Yes, there are rules for the people that had bond servants. Verse 44. Uh, Both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall ye buy bondmen and bondmaids. Moreover, of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy, and of their families that are with you, which they beget or begat in your land, and they shall be your possession. And ye shall take them as an, as an inheritance for your children after you to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, ye shall not rule one over another with rigor. So there were rules that God set down for having Jewish, a Jew having a Jewish servant. If they were having money problems, you were allowed to, to have them as your servant, but only for six years. You let them go the seventh. Okay, and we read earlier that if they don't want to go, well, then that's a different story. But the fact is, the Lord's saying if you have really, really hard work to do and bond servants, you know, and things, then you buy them from the heathen that are round about. Like Abraham there, he was giving them bond servants and, and bond maids from the Pharaoh of Egypt. Okay, so again, you see it there. Now you say, well, this is all Old Testament. This is all stuff in the Old Testament, and we're not in the Old Testament anymore. Well, that's correct. What about the New Testament? 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to go over here. 
And it's kind of funny because a lot of Christians will use this verse to try and prove all sorts of things. And they don't actually take it for its literal meaning. Meaning, excuse me, because its literal meaning is very politically incorrect. 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting at verse 1. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm teaching and exhorting. <laughs> Okay, you say, well, this has to do with an employer and an employee relationship. Really? You mean to tell me when you get a job that you are under the yoke? No, you're not under the yoke. Yeah, you work for your boss, but you can come and go. He doesn't own you. Okay, the yoke there is talking about a servant and a bond servant. Or I'm sorry, a master and a bond servant. Excuse me. That's what it's talking about. Now, is there application to the thing of having an employer? Well, sure. Absolutely. You should work for your boss and do a good job and everything else. Okay? But this is not talking about that. If you are a servant under the yoke, you are a bond servant. Okay? You don't go into your boss at work and say, Good morning, master. He's not your bad master. He's, he's your employer but he's not your master but uh, it says there that you're to count these bond servants are to count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of god and his doctrine be not blasphemed in other words if you're a saved bond servant then you're not to do anything that would cause god's word to be blasphemed and they that have believing masters christian masters let them not despise them because they are brethren you don't say hey you have no right to own me you're not to despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. You each do your part, in other words. You don't say, hey, we're equal. You know, you, you don't have a right to boss me around. It's not what you do. You say, well, I don't know about that. Okay, we'll turn over to Philemon. Philemon chapter 1. <laughs> there is only one chapter. So that would make it chapter 1. Philemon 1, verses 10 through 19. We're going to see a very interesting thing here. Kind of tying in with 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Okay. Verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. What Paul meant there is that he saved him. He led him to the Lord. So then he became sort of a son to Paul, spiritually speaking. Verse 11, Which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. Good definition for the word imputation. Verse 19, I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. <laughs> Paul kind of puts that little thing in there. You know, you owe me a lot, Philemon. You know, well, what's going on here? Well, Philemon had a servant. Right there you see it in verse 16. And his servant's name was Onesimus. Verse 10. And Paul is saying, we're both in prison. Me and Ones Ones Onesimus, excuse me. And Onesimus just got out of jail, and I'm sending him back to you, Philemon, 
you know, he was unprofitable to you, but I'm actually sending him back as a servant. And by the way, if you don't want him, I'll take him and he can come minister to me. That's what it's saying. Paul didn't say to him, Onesimus is a free man now. How dare you have him as your bondservant? He doesn't say that. He says, hey, I'm sending him back, and if you don't want him, I'll take him. What are you going to do with that? And by the way, it doesn't say that Onesimus was a black man. Onesimus could have been a Jew. I have no idea what what uh, Onesimus was. So don't take it as, a, as an insult if you are you know, African descent. Okay? He could have been a Jew. I, I don't know. I have no idea. He could have been a Gentile. Whatever. But the point is, he was a bond servant that had left his master. He was unprofitable to him. Ended up in jail. Paul meets him in jail, leads him to the Lord, and he says, hey, you're getting out of jail? Okay, take this letter to your master, and if he doesn't want you, I'll take you. What are you going to do with that? Now, we're not going to turn here, but uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 26, Jesus Christ says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you ashamed of the Bible for teaching slavery? You say, well, I just don't know if I can stand for the Word of God if it's going to teach slavery as being acceptable. Well, then you got a problem. Don't let the politically incorrect or the politically correct world of today influence you to turn against the Bible. You say, well, I got to conform to the world. Uh, not a good idea. The world is saying that the Bible is hate literature because it says that sodomy is an abomination. Don't fall for it. The world says that this is patriarchy, the feminist movement. How dare they say that God is a male trinity. The Godhead is male. We won't have a man to run over, rule over us. That's what the feminists say. You know, They say patriarchy is a great evil. Okay, then they're lost. <laughs> You know, but see, oh, we've got to be politically correct. It, when it says man, we shouldn't say man. We should say person. You know, when it says our fathers, it should be our ancestors. That's nonsense. The Lord would not direct anybody to do that. Okay? Like the new versions do. Like the NIV does. And you say, well, I'd, I'd kind of like to find middle ground with the lost world. Okay, then, according to Luke chapter 9, verse 26, Jesus Christ is ashamed of you. These modern politically correct Christians, Jesus Christ is ashamed of them. If they're saved, if they are saved, Jesus Christ looks down and he says, I am ashamed of you. What a terrible thing. Very sad thing. But now what about spiritual application for a bond servant Christian? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You say, I, I think that this whole thing is just so repulsive to me. To have bond servants. Oh, it's just so so horrible. It's such a terrible thing. We're going to see about that. First Corinthians chapter six, verse nineteen and twenty. Now we've been over these before, but uh, we're going to hit them again here this morning. First Corinthians chapter six, verse nineteen it says here, "What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own?" Hmm. Verse 20, For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Did you know that your body does not belong to you? If you're a Christian? You say, well, come on now. Well, I don't remember God buying me. Really? Turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Do you remember why God originally destroyed Jerusalem? Because there was innocent blood there and God would not forget about that. He wouldn't overlook it. Jesus Christ shed his perfect innocent blood on the cross. And if you're a Christian, that was the purchase price of your salvation. And God's not going to just 
Meh, who cares? You know, somebody don't want to accept me. You know, my son, my the blood that I shed on the cross to pay for them. Ah, it's okay. No, no. <laughs> that was a very serious thing. And if you are bought with the blood of God, that's what it says there in the verse, it's God's blood that was shed by Jesus Christ on the cross, which means that Jesus Christ is God, by the way. Another proof that Jesus Christ is God. There, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Again, another verse that's attacked in a lot of the new versions. But the point is, we are bought with a price. And your body is not your own. So if you are saved and you say, I don't believe in bond servants, I don't believe in slavery, you got a real problem. Because we are bond servants to Jesus Christ. Hmm. Something to think about. Okay, you say, what is the lost world's reaction to God's quote-unquote slavery? Turn back to Psalm 2. This is where we're going to close this morning. Psalm 2. We see there that if you are saved, then you are a bond servant of Jesus Christ. But we're, we're going to see here what the lost world thinks about all that. Psalm 2, verse one Actually, we're going to read the whole psalm. It's only 12 verses, so it's not very long. Psalm 2. It says here, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Okay, notice it's heathen there. We're not talking about saved people. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, now look at this, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Hmm. Do you know what happens when a bond servant wants to get away from his master? He breaks the chains and he breaks the cords and he casts them away. And he takes off and runs. Do you know what? That's a picture of the lost world. They look at that purchase price that Jesus Christ shed on the cross, the blood. And they say, no thank you. I want my life. I don't want you to tell me what to do. What they don't realize is that they're actually servants to the devil. <laughs> they're actually falling right into his plan. But the fact is, they look at what Jesus Christ did and they realize, if I get saved, I'm going to have to give up all this stuff. Okay? Don't fall for this teaching, this modern false teaching, that the lost world can't understand that they're sinners and they can't understand repentance. That's nonsense. Total nonsense. But you see, there's a whole lot of Baptists out there now. Uh, I know a lot of them, personally. You know? And they're backing off from this thing because, see, I believe it's because they have church buildings and they want to keep those church buildings filled. And if you preach against sin, well, you can't fill them. See? You know? So you just preach, come in, receive, believe and receive Jesus, you know, and stuff, and then we'll talk to you about sin after you get saved. It's nonsense. And the lost world, most of them know it. They don't want the chains that come with salvation. They don't want to be tied to God and to the written Word of God. They don't want to be told what they can and cannot do. And that's why they don't want to be saved. They say, let's break those bands, cast away those cords. I don't, I don't want to be bound to this book. And that's what that dirty little sodomite in that, in that university was doing. Why was he attacking the Bible? Because the Bible condemns his sin. And he says, I don't want that. I want to cast those cords away. I don't, I don't want that. That's what's going on. That's why people reject this book. Every branch we were you know, talking about the other day, science rejects the Bible. You know, we, they come up with this idiotic theory of evolution, which nobody in, in, their, in their right mind would believe it, but they believe it because it gets rid of the Bible. You know, The medical establishment, the educational establishment, the government, all these people, all, every sector of this world, they're rejecting the Word of God because they can't stand those bonds that come when you believe, when you become a Christian. They don't want them. But what's God's reaction? Is God up there going, oh no, oh, oh, they, they don't want to be controlled by me, oh, oh, oh. What's it say here? Verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. You know what derision is? It's making fun of somebody. God actually makes fun of the lost world. 
Oh, I know. I can't believe a loving God would do a thing like that. Uh huh. Right. When innocent blood is shed and the people don't care about it, God doesn't pardon them for that. Continuing, verse 5. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That's a prophetic reference first to Jesus Christ coming there. I have begotten thee, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That's Jesus Christ. But also, it says about he's going to get the heathen for his, his inheritance. All these people that make fun of Jesus Christ right now, they're going to become his inheritance. And this thing could be a few years down, you know, a little bit more than seven years away. <laughs> you know, this could happen very soon. The millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. And watch out for any movement that says, number one, that the millennium does not exist. That's amillennialism. Or postmillennialism is that man brings in a thousand years of peace and Jesus Christ comes at the end. What they're doing is they're trying to steal verse 8 from Jesus Christ. The inheritance that God promised to his begotten son, only begotten son, Jesus Christ, they're trying to steal that. Watch out for any movement like that. Okay, verse 10. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. The heathen, listen up. Verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Have you put your trust in Jesus Christ for salvation? You say, well, I don't think I'm ready yet. You're running out of time. There's a lot of people that think that, well, you know, that rapture stuff and the tribulation, that's you know, a hundred years away. Oh, I don't think so. It's getting very, very close. Okay, when you get a world that's getting so wicked that there's nothing that you can do to stop it, I mean, it's it's like a race for the bottom right now. You know, morality and, and, and just violence and, and just everything. It's just like everybody's racing to see who can top the other one, you know, getting worse and worse and worse. More and more people are blaspheming the Word of God. Right, there's very little time to be saved but <clears throat> you need to understand that the bible is not going to fit with our modern politically correct god-hating society it's not going to fit you can't reconcile the two you can't bring the lost world and the saved world together in spite of what the modern churches are trying to teach by the way you have to stay separate so you say well then you're saying then that the bible does teach slavery yes I'm saying that because slavery is a historical reality. And by the way, if you say, well, I refuse to believe in slavery, we're going to have a real problem because you see slavery not only is a historical reality, it still is a reality. It's a reality right now. And there's a lot of people who are in bondage to this world's system. They are in bondage to alcohol. They are in bondage to pornography, to cigarettes, to lots of things. You better pick the right bondage to be in. You want to be a bond servant, you better be a bond servant to Jesus Christ. Because he's the only master that's really truly worth serving. Every other master out there that you serve, and you will serve a master. There's a lot of people that think, I'm no man's slave. Really? Are you a slave to mammon? The Bible says no man can serve two masters. And in the, in the passage there, it's talking about mammon. God or mammon. There's a lot of people that have their whole career thing and they think that they got it all worked out and I'm working my way up the ladder of success and stuff. No, you're a servant to mammon. You're a bond servant. Okay? And a lot of those people are going to find their whole world come crashing down if this nation ever hits hyperinflation or, you know, bank holiday or whatever else. You know? I'm telling you. You're going to be a bond servant in this life to somebody. Everybody has to serve someone. Now, either you're going to serve Satan or you're going to serve the Lord. And if you serve 
Satan, there are rules for him. Okay, whatever you do, he's going to destroy you. But if you serve God, there are also rules for that. You can read about them in the Bible. And these people that say, I refuse, I don't want to serve God. Okay, then they're going to go to hell. And that's where they're going to be for all of eternity. So don't be ashamed of the Word of God, the King James Bible. Don't let some wicked sinner out there who's trying to break the cords that God has created, to break the bondservant chains, don't let them talk you out of your faith in the Word of God. All right? All right, one other verse was brought up here. I just want to add in here before the study ends. Revelation chapter 18, verse 13 says, And cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. Now that's a future reference. Okay, this is a reference to Mystery Babylon. So are there slaves in the future? Absolutely. Very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. So uh, you can see that there are slaves in the past and there are slaves presently and in the future as well. So don't think, oh, we've abolished slavery. The, the great evil of slavery is gone. Wrong. As long as there's war, as long as there's fighting, as long as there's lust and greed and money, you know, and power and all that, there will be slaves. So don't let anybody talk you out of your faith in the King James Bible. So that's going to be it for this morning. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, P.A. 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.